Zoom is always a little slow to connect everybody. Okay, I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar that is on cybersecurity and features Alex Stamos. My name is Chris Marty and I'm the VP of Data Analytics and Executive Education at MSCI. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Your audio will be muted for the entirety of this webinar, as will your camera, so we will not be able to hear you or see you. That being said, you can ask questions through the Q&A capabilities of Zoom. And I would ask that you submit your questions when you think of them. Don't wait until our Q&A session when Alex has finished with, a, with his presentation. It's nice to have your questions uh, queued up and ready to go for us when we start the Q&A. There will be a recording made of this webinar and it will be available afterwards uh, for a period of 30 days. So with all that said, I'd like to introduce Alex Stamos. Alex is a cybersecurity expert and business leader and entrepreneur whose career has focused on improving the security and the safety of the internet. He's the former chief security officer of Facebook and the former chief information security officer at Yahoo. He's currently an adjunct professor at Stanford University and he has also been involved most recently with securing the US election system as a contributor to Harvard's Defending Digital Democracy Project. And I, I think we'll talk a little bit about that before we finish, Alex. Alex uh, helps organizations better understand cyber threats and how to stay one step ahead of bad actors. So with that introduction, Alex, I think we're all looking forward to what you have to say today. So it's all yours. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thank you everybody for attending today. I uh, hope everybody is safe at home. We, we were all supposed to be able to, to do this together a little while ago, uh, and obviously things have changed. Um, but I am glad that you're able to attend today and we're able to have this discussion. Uh, so as Chris said, um, I am currently director of Stanford Internet Observatory, uh, and we are doing work on how the internet can be used to cause harm. Uh, you know, as part of the Stanford Cyber Policy Center and the uh, International Relations uh, Institute there, uh, a lot of our focus is on uh, not just regular harm on the internet, but issues that have geopolitical and geo, uh, in, in historical importance. Um, and that's one of the things we want to talk about today is, is how is the current kind of political, geopolitical, uh, international situation affecting cybersecurity? And why is this an area of concern of for companies both large and small, including a lot of the companies that are part of here today? Um, so what I thought I'd do is uh, kind of talk through the overall big picture of what's going on and what's driving risk online for a lot of, of organizations, especially ones that have an international focus. Uh, and then um, we'll dive into some uh, specific examples of what's happened to companies uh, and then some suggestions of the ways you can think about this. Now, I, I know this is not an IT audience, so we're not going to get into a lot of the technical details, uh, but my goal is to try to help you understand organizationally what you, how you might want to build an organization uh, that thinks about security, prepares for these issues, and is able to handle anything that happens. Uh, and then like Chris says, you know, I'm doing a lot of work these days around the election. Uh, so I think we'll have some time at the end to chat uh, and we should be able to use that to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on here in the US. So uh, like Chris said, uh, by the way, I'd like this to be interactive. So I, I have the Q&A uh, window open. If you have any questions, just throw it in and we'll, we'll make sure to take care of it uh, as we go through the presentation. No, no reason to wait for the end, but we'll, we'll also have time then. This is a picture uh, that some of you might recognize. It's a picture of a, the center of Cairo, Egypt, a place called Tahrir Square. This is the heart of the start of what is uh, now called the Arab Spring, of a series of uprisings across the Middle East and North Africa of mostly Muslim countries uh, that was sparked by uh, long-standing grievances that people had against the autocratic nature of their governments, but then organized online. I show this to you because this is really kind of the height of the belief of technologists that the internet is going to be a force for good and a force for liberalization and for the freedom of individuals. Um, more than really any other event up to this point, this was kind of the moment at which we could take credit 
or something positive happening um, that uh, online that uh, could not have happened in the pre-internet world. Uh, you know, most of these countries have been autocracies for a, a very long period of time. Uh, but in the pre-internet era, in the pre-social media era, it was very difficult for people to organize safely uh, online. Um, and this is just the, the, the reality of living in an autocratic society has traditionally been uh, that the ability to kind of safely collaborate and safely communicate is one of the great weaknesses of any of these pro-democracy movements. That changed with the invent of social media, the invent of secure messaging uh, from, from a peer to peer. And uh, the fact that uh, by 2011, a huge percentage of the population of, of these countries, including Egypt, were walking around with pop pocket supercomputers that were always on and always connected to the internet. Um, and so Tahrir Square was a big moment. In, in Silicon Valley, we were thinking to ourselves, man, this demonstrates the positivity of the internet, the benefit you get uh, for, for this, uh, you benefit you can give people by giving them this kind of communication. Um, and uh, this was was an incredibly positive thing and something that we built a lot of our self uh, worth around in Silicon Valley. This is what Trier Square looked like two years later. So the, the truth, the unfortunate truth of the Arab Spring is that while there was a lot of excitement in the beginning of uh, these uprisings, that excitement very quickly dissipated as the countries involved, the nations involved, were able to um, not just suppress those specific uprisings at that moment, but were able to build intelligence apparatuses that were much smarter around online organizing. Um, this took a variety of forms, some of them technical. So they built a bunch of technical capabilities to monitor internet access, to inject themselves into connections, to do some of the stuff that would come out that bigger countries like the United States uh, are, are able to do. That these much smaller countries were able to build some pretty significant cyber warfare capabilities. But then they also were able to utilize their control of people's offline lives to then leverage that to control their online. Uh, in Egypt, for example, the, you know, the Mubarak government that was being protested against did fall. Uh, and there, there was a series of elections, but eventually Egypt ended up with another effectively military dictatorship uh, that lasts to today that is no better than the Mubarak regime. And one of the reasons they've been able to stay in power, is they've been very good at infiltrating different groups of people, especially young people and students who might be interested in democracy uh, and then effectively forcing them to turn over their friends. You don't have to break encryption. You don't have to break in people's phones. If you put people into the, the basement of the secret police headquarters and you, you, you beat them up for a while, it turns out that they will do pretty much anything you want on Twitter, on Facebook, on WhatsApp. Uh, and so, you know, the reality of the internet has turned out that while it can be used for lots of positive purposes, there's also a significant undercurrent of autocracies using the internet to cause harm. A couple of examples since the Arab Spring, uh, we've had uh, the oppression of the Rohingya minority in Myanmar, which has been organized and driven by uh, lots of online activity and something that the, the uh, Burmese government and the Burmese speaking army has used very effectively. Um, we've had uh, suppression of the color revolutions uh, throughout um, uh, Central Asia. Uh, and uh, we, we continue to have uh, suppression in the Middle East and North Africa. While you have this going on, where, where people are using these kinds of capabilities against their local population, what has also happened is that the internet has become one of the core areas of great power competition. These, this is uh, from a parade in China. Uh, these are members of the People's, Arboration, uh, People's Liberation Army Navy. Uh, and the People's Liberation Army, the, which is the term for all of the military forces in the People's Republic of China, uh, has over 100,000 people working on offensive cyber capabilities. 100,000 people. That's larger than some people's entire military just working on cyber. Now, I'm guessing they're not as tall and good looking uh, as the people that they bring out for parades, but these are uniformed members of the military who are drafted based upon their skills that they show in school, are given specific training, and then spend all day actively attacking uh, China's competitors for their long-term, both military, but also financial co competition. The internet has become the way that great powers express these issues and, and work out these issues. Um, and in some ways this is good, right? It's, it's way better that people are hacking each other uh, than are 
going and um, you know starting wars or or doing things like uh, supporting proxy wars in a variety of places, right? It's it is better that this stuff happens online. Um, but the, the net outcome has been that the, the internet has become a very, very dangerous place thanks to the drive and number of countries to utilize it. And not just for military purposes, uh, but a big part of the risk that comes from, from especially Chinese hackers, but also a number of other countries, is that the internet has become a core component of economic sabotage um, and economic espionage of countries building up their economic capabilities based upon internet intrusion capabilities. Um, I'm sorry, I, we have some stuff going on here in the house. It's it, like other people, uh, my kids being at school means they're not really at school. Um, so what does this mean globally? Well, so for folks like you, I'm sorry, what does this mean locally? For folks like you, this means that if you are operating and competing against Chinese companies, then your company is considered to be a legitimate target of the the state institutions of the People's Republic of China and their state hackers. Um, this means that uh, if you know, a company large or small, even if you're not operating directly in China, that you can be assigned a team out of the People's Liberation Army, the Ministry of State Security, or what's more common these days, a variety of smaller hacking groups that are able to, that are supported by the government, but are able to be hired by Chinese industry to infiltrate competitors overseas. Uh, and in the metals industry, this is actually has a significant history, uh, significant history, uh, especially tax against US Steel uh, and Alcoa and a couple of their large companies, that the United States has actually turned this into an international trade matter. Now this, uh, this filing by the US and the ITC didn't really go anywhere. Um, it turns out that this is not a mechanism for working out our issues on cyber uh, issues is through the ITC. Um, but it's really interesting to me that this is now seen as just a part of competition along with Chinese companies dumping, manipulating markets, manipulating their currencies. Cyber intrusion has just become another way for Chinese companies to try to dominate uh, the market and to establish dominance in critical industries such as the middles industry. What is also happening is that you have a number of companies that maybe are not being directly targeted, but become uh, effectively collateral damage in the battle between great powers. So we talked a lot about China and that the Chinese operations are generally constrained to thing that China, things that China believes is in their best interest, both economic and militarily. Another great power that does a lot of offensive cyber work, I think that I don't have to tell all you folks that you've heard a lot about is obviously Russia, right? Russia is another country that has uh, very capable hackers, that has a confederation of hackers in the private sector and in the public sector who work together. But in the Russian case, often their operations are much less controlled um, and much more destructive. And as a result of that, you end up with a situation like what Maersk faced where they became a collateral damage to uh, a, a, a conflict between two powers. In the case of Maersk, that collateral damage uh, was in the, the war between Russia and Ukraine. As a lot of you know, uh, Russia invaded a significant portion of Ukraine and continues to occupy uh, a significant portion of Ukrainian territory. There's a variety of reasons for this, of both language and cultural ties and people who live there, but most importantly, of the military access that this gives them to the Black Sea. Uh, as part of Russia's campaign against Ukraine, one of the things that they did is they had a, a massive uh, amount of uh, cyber attacks uh, and disinformation attacks against the Ukrainian government uh, and anybody who, who stepped up to operate with the Ukraine. One of the ways they did, did this is that there was an infiltration of a very small company in Ukraine. And this, this small software company was turned out to be very important because any business that operates in Ukraine has to pay Ukrainian taxes. This is not for any of you who operate internationally, tax time lasts all year, right? Because everybody has different deadlines uh, and you end up having to file taxes all over the world and do all kinds of crazy accounting to take advantage of that. Uh, that's obviously true for a company like Maersk that operates in a hundred different countries. Um, if you want to file Ukrainian taxes, there's only one piece of software that you can do that with. Right? Um, and so every company that operates in Ukraine has to have a copy of the software, the, effectively the TurboTax of Ukraine on a computer somewhere. And that computer has to have access to really sensitive data. It has to have access to your financial records and such. 
Now, in theory, you could highly isolate this software and you could put it in the corner and make it impossible for, for it to do anything bad, but that's not how most corporate networks work. And this was taken advantage of uh, by the Russians uh, when that's, that company was broken into and they embedded a piece of malware into that tax software. Now, this tax software was distributed, it's sitting in everybody's computers, everything's going fine. And then one day that malware wakes up. And what it did was it just it effectively destroyed all the data on that computer and then spread to all the other computers on the network um, that were connected via the same kind of Windows networking technologies, which is a common way that people uh, build their corporate networks. That was, this ended up creating billions and billions of dollars uh, of damage around the world. And, and probably the most uh, obvious example of this was the Maersk shipping line, where their corporate Windows network was almost completely destroyed by this virus, which was called NotPetya, um, that, uh, where they lost a huge amount of their data. And s systems went down all around the world, in their offices, in ports, in the uh, offices of longshoremen, the computers on the desktops of the captain. Now there's no examples of this actually affecting ships themselves. It turns out the si systems that are used to run ships generally aren't con connected to the network um, and aren't using Windows, but the computer on the captain's desk that he uses to email his boss and to figure out where he's supposed to go and to handle uh, what's being offloaded and not, that got deleted. So all of these computers get deleted, Maersk effectively shuts down for months. Um, in the in fact, the only reason that they're probably a going concern these days is it turns out that one of their ports in Africa had a power failure that day. So all of Maersk's computers in this one port were down and therefore they could not get infected by this virus and they could not get deleted. Uh, and so there's actually a very interesting story where Maersk sent their, sent their IT people from London to fly to Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, and then um, the, the people in this port, I believe it was uh, Abuja, flew to Lagos and in the Lagos airport, which I've been in, and it's the kind of airport where people are just walking around with AK-47s and it makes you really nervous because it's not clear whether they're cops or not and they're supposed to be doing that. In this airport, they handed over the hard drive of that computer, which had the last copy of Maersk's Active Directory network of who the users were of the computers of all the credentials and such. And that was the start that allowed Maersk to rebuild. Maersk was not a specific target of this. The target of this was the Ukrainian uh, um, economy uh, and uh, an attempt by the Russians to punish any company that dared to operate in Ukraine. Um, and, uh, but they were collateral damage and it, it almost ended them as a company. Another interesting side note is there continues to be litigation about the insurance impact of uh, this malware. A number of companies have purchased cyber insurance. It's something that now a lot of people look at. In my experience, cyber insurance is really a strange beast. It's not very well priced. The process you go through to buy cyber insurance, they ask you questions that are generally very irrelevant to the kinds of cyber risk that you face as an organization. Um, but a lot of the companies that were hit by NotPetya had some kind of cyber insurance that was supposed to pay off. This virus that was, again, released by the Russian military pretended to be ransomware. Uh, ransomware being malware that encrypts your hard drive to make money. That's exactly what you buy uh, cyber insurance for is to do something like pay a ransom so you can get your data back in case it's been taken over. But in the end, it turned out not to be ransomware. There was actually no way to unlock it. It turned out to be a weapon. And so there's actually now a lot of litigation because the standard boilerplate contracts for a lot of insurance says that they do not cover acts of war. Um, and this is being fought all over the world of whether or not the release of this malware was an act of war um, or uh, because it was released by a sovereign state as part of a geopolitical struggle um, or, or whether uh, this should be considered just a normal cyber attack. Um, so it's, it is interesting to get cyber insurance. I think it is a smart thing for most organizations if you can find it uh, and it's affordable. But don't expect that it's going to be there in these kinds of exigent circumstances. And it turns out in the cyber world, everything's an exigent circumstance, right? Like there's a lot of situations like that. Um, so what I thought I'd do really fast then is kind of now that we've talked about this specific examples, is talk about what is the state of play of the different uh, uh, governments and uh, organizations involved in this kind of hacking. And the way I like to break up the, the, the adversaries here uh, is in the four groups. The first at the top is the superpowers, right? So these are countries that are able to operate large, well-funded professional hacking organizations and are tie those into all of their other intelligence operations. Um, this kind of tying between human intelligence and signals intelligence 
is incredibly powerful. And there's been a number of instances where there's been a hack and as part of that, when, when the investigation happens, it turns out that the attackers knew a lot about the company. They knew a lot about the people that work there and how the network worked and stuff. And the assumption of a lot of people afterwards was, oh, well, this is actually a great indication that they had some kind of spy inside the company that was helping out. Uh, these kind of countries are able to build advanced self-driving malware. So not Petya, which I talked about. Stuxnet is a great example of malware that was written by the United States and Israel that was used to attack the Iranian nuclear facilities. There's a later piece of American malware called Flame um, and Duku, which is malware that it turns out infected a significant percentage of the computers in the Middle East and was just waiting there for the United States to call in and to use it. Um, and often these uh, superpowers have careful operational security, that they have the ability to cover their tracks. Now, they don't always cover their tracks. And most famously, the Russians kind of don't care if people catch them. That's kind of a, a hallmark of Russian intelligence operations over the last decade is the fact that they are doing these things are part of the message. They don't mind that people know that not Petya was them. They want to do it. It's the same reason they kill people with nerve agents instead of running them over with a car right? Um, is that they're saying, this is us, we're doing this, you're not safe from us. Whereas operations from the Chinese, for example, are often much more carefully planned and much more carefully covered up. Who are the superpowers? So the absolute best hackers in the world work for the five eyes. The five eyes is a intelligence um, uh, compact uh, between the United States and four of our Anglophone partners, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. These five countries share data, they share capabilities, they share software. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the Snowden documents, most of those documents are marked five eyes only. They're not just internal NSA documents. They were documents that were being created and shared between the different partners in the five eyes. Uh, and if you look at those documents closely, it turns out there's a bunch of things that were built in the UK and then deployed by the US, uh, built by the US and deployed by the Australians and, and, and so forth. You know, our allies and, and us in the United States, we are, have the best hackers in the world. The difference between the Five Eyes and other countries is that the application of, their, of these capabilities is often restricted to a very tight definition of what is in our national interest. And so you don't see the United States hacking on behalf of American companies. Uh, you folks are not able to go call your cousin in the military and say, hey, can you go hack my Chinese competitor to steal all of their customer data? That's just not how it happens. You know, if, if somebody is hacking on behalf of the United States, uh, they are doing so because they have been ordered by the president of the United States, either directly or indirectly by the EOs that have been passed. There's kind of a funny irony here, which is in the US, our hacking is socialized. And in Russia and China, it's capitalist. Right? Everybody who hacks on behalf of the United States is paid by the American taxpayer, uh, either directly or indirectly, whereas people who hack in Russia and China are often have to make their own money through their hacking and then also do the uh, patriotic hacking on the side. Obviously, China is very high on the list. We've talked a lot about China. China has both official hacking capabilities in the PLA, in the Ministry of State Security, in the People's Security Bureau. China is a big country with a big government, um, and there's a lot of different agencies that do this hacking. What they've also done is they've created all of these independent hacking groups that then can get hired. So it is more like if you're an important businessman, you can call your cousin who's in the People's Liberation Army. He gives you the phone number of some guy you can hire that guy and he will help you hack into your competitors in the US and the Chinese government looks the other way while these kinds of operations happen. Russia, very, very aggressive. Again, lots of private sector hackers who also work with the public sector. Um, I had a run in with this when I was the CISO of Yahoo. We had a breach by hackers working for the FSB, but they weren't uniformed FSB agents. They're run by a guy named Alexei, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I forgot Alexi's last name, they'll come back to me. Um, but Alexi and his team, Alexi was actually a hacker that was caught by the FSB and they gave him the option of going to jail or working for the government and he chose the government. And so they let him do hacking for himself and to make a bunch of money stealing Bitcoin and the like. Um, but then also he gets a phone call and has to do work for, for the FSB. Um, Israel is probably the US ally who's the most aggressive about using hacking capabilities. They're also very, very good at covering their tracks. 
And there have been examples of breaches that are both related to national security issues, especially you know, issues that might involve Iran um, or Palestinian groups that have been traced to Israel, as well as some economic espionage. And there is some history of economic espionage from Israeli companies, although again, they're much more subtle about it. And then it's interesting, there's a set of, of allies, of NATO allies mostly, um, who have capabilities but are much more subtle in their application. France, Germany, as people expected. Um, one of the interesting kind of uh, come from behind winners in the last couple of years is the Netherlands. It turns out the Netherlands has a really good offensive hacking team. And one of the reasons we know this is that a bunch of the information in uh, the Mueller report about the GRU and Russian hacking capability, it turns out came from the Dutch hackers who had broken into the GRU. And in fact, there's this great report about who's hacking on behalf of Russia, where the Dutch had broken into the camera system in the actual building these guys work in, in Moscow, and had the, the faces of all the people who work in the building, because they had broken into the security cameras. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's, I felt like it's all been downhill for the Netherlands since the Hundred Years' War, uh, but apparently in the cyber world, um, they're much more aggressive than the next uh, category is a category of, of, of countries that are actually of concern to a lot of American businesses. I'm calling them the rapid risers, but these are countries that are investing heavily in their cyber capabilities to fix an asymmetry between them and the larger superpowers. Uh, and that means both militarily and economically. Iran is at the top of this list. Uh, Iran has, has heavily invested in cyber capabilities. They've also used it in destructive ways. So Iran has used their cyber capabilities to uh, hurt the American banking industry and such. Uh, uh, and, and in a way that is kind of reflective of, of Russia and how Russia operates, which is not a surprise because some of these capabilities, it looks like the Iranians purchased from the Russians. Um, North Korea has invested heavily in their, their hacking capabilities. There's actually a great Department of Justice indictment of the Lazarus group, which is what one of these groups is called, that talks about how does this hermit kingdom where people don't have computers at home, how do they become such good hackers. And it turns out they did all this crazy stuff where they created fake passports, they sent their, their hackers overseas, they sent them to conferences and stuff like that. And then there's a number of interesting countries like Vietnam, South Korea, and the like, who are using hacking for economic espionage. Um, South Korea is a really interesting one. They're a US ally, um, but there have been a number of examples of South Korean hacking groups breaking into American companies where those American companies are either doing business deals with South Korean companies or are competing with South Korean companies. Uh, so if, if you're doing work in South Korea, you have to be very, very careful, careful of what laptops you send. To South Korea. Um, we have a group that I'm calling the Peloton, which is kind of the, the mushy middle of all these governments that have some kind of cyber capabilities, but not, aren't investing incredibly heavily and don't have the capabilities of these top two. India and Pakistan are constantly throwing stuff at one another over the border online. Um, Saudi Arabia has been really gearing up to counteract the Iranians, but they're not as good at it. Um, so the Saudi government just kind of uses money to buy lots of stuff and to utilize it. C countries like Brazil, Turkey. Turkey has a lot of hacking capability that they use against their own people in suppression on behalf of the Iranian government. Uh, and then there's a bunch of countries that just happen to buy off the shelf um, software. And, and these people, they're usually not using it for economic espionage or uh, intelligence gathering. They're using these capabilities against their own people. That includes Mexico, who got caught uh, planting malware that they had purchased from an Israeli company on the phones of a bunch of their own journalists, Ethiopia, UAE, and so on. So anyway, kind of my, my point here is everybody is getting into this game, right? 15, 20 years ago, the use of cyber power for economic and military espionage was something that you would have the big countries do and the little countries just kind of watched. But now all of this stuff is so commoditized and so well documented that anybody can get into it. Um, and so you end up with a situation that if you operate almost anywhere in the world, there is the potential of risk that's being created by this. Uh, the other interesting thing that's happened in the last couple of years is a lot of the cyber capabilities that might be uh, uh, deployed against companies have also been uh, converted into disinformation capabilities. And we're at the beginning of this. Uh, you know, everybody's heard about things that happened during the 2016 election. Uh, I can talk a bit about what I'm worried about in the 2020 election. And so we talk a lot about online disinformation in the government context where people, governments, you know, the Russia is planting fake news in the United States, Iran and Saudi Arabia are running propaganda outlets against each other. That's all for geopolitical purposes, but we're starting to see the use of disinformation against companies to hurt them, to hurt them in situations where they might be competing or they might be doing things that 
anger a government. And the Chinese in, in particular um, have started to innovate in this space where what you see is that if a company uh, all of a sudden does something that the Chinese government doesn't like. So a great example, this is the NBA, um, where the NBA didn't even make a decision themselves. They had one of their, mem uh, one of their general managers tweeted something about uh, China's activity uh, uh, against their own ethnic minorities. Um, and uh, even though this wasn't an official position, and even though the NBA very quickly disowned and said, hey, this guy doesn't speak on behalf of all of us, this is his personal opinion, there was a massive information operation against the NBA, both domestically in China, but then around the world in English and other languages, right? So if you piss off the Chinese government, you can end up in a situation where maybe they do some hacking and they hurt you that way, but the other thing they might try to do is to ruin your reputation around the world. This is a very difficult thing for companies to defend against because you're not defending your own network here, right? When you're you know, doing cyber protection, if, if Maersk had come to me before NotPetya, I can give them a nice list of things this is what you think about to secure your computers, to monitor them, to secure networks, to build uh, isolation, to patch. You know, but that was because they can secure things that's in their control. When you talk about disinformation, it's not your control. The, the things that are being attacked are newspapers, social media, people, people's belief systems. And so it's a lot harder for companies to respond to these kinds of things because the kinds of what you have as a company is you have a PR team and you have the ability to get your message out and to talk to the media. You generally don't have the capability to understand what's going on around the world, uh, what kind of discussions are being had about you, and then to counteract that on social media. Um, and so it, it is an interesting asymmetry between government power and corporate power. And I think we're going to see more and more of this kind of work. So, so what can you do about it, right? So like, you know, I've just talked about how risky the whole world is. Um, what, what, what are you actually supposed to do and how are you supposed to think about these things? So if you're operating globally, kind of my, my, my biggest lesson here is you have to pay attention to the geopolitics and the places where you're operating and you have to think about how that might reflect itself in cyber operations against you. So if, if you are competing heavily against a Chinese company, that is the kind of thing that you can't just consider from a competition standpoint, but you have to consider from an economic espionage standpoint, and you have to put into your plan from an IT perspective. And I think we keep on seeing this situation where companies kind of just go along their business, they do the security stuff they're supposed to do, they patch their servers, they buy some antivirus, and they think that's enough because that, and that was enough. 10 years ago, that was, that was okay. It was okay just to mind your own business. But the truth is, is that anybody that's operating globally is now part of this great power competition between these countries and, it, and is, is not just a bystander, but is, an act, is seen as an active participant in economic warfare, even if they don't think about that. A great example of this is Marriott. Um, Marriott bought Starwood. A lot of people on this call probably know that because we all were Starwood points uh, owners, SPG members, um, and we had our, our, our points converted to Marriott points. Uh, and uh, at, shortly after they did that, they discovered that Starwood's database of all of the people who had stayed in Starwood properties, their passport numbers, where they had stayed, where they had traveled, all that kind of information had been being stolen over multiple years by the Chinese government. Marriott and Starwood did not consider themselves players in geopolitics, right? Like they're a hotel chain. They open up nice hotels, they give people nice fluffy towels, they maybe they have a nice sauna uh, in the basement. They were not thinking of themselves in this place, but it turns out that a record of people's passport numbers and everywhere that they stayed can turn out to be incredibly powerful information for intelligence agencies. And for China specifically, we keep on seeing this where the Chinese steal huge amounts of data that they're not totally sure what they're gonna do with and they throw it into their data warehouses and they're able to merge it up with other stuff. So Marriott's database of where people have stayed combined with the breach of the Office of Personnel Management which it had the security clearance forms for tens of millions of Americans, including myself, who had applied for security clearances, uh, combined with the data from Anthem, which turns out to be one of the largest insurance agencies for the US government, combined with the output of the Sabre system, which had the travel information from a bunch of large airlines. When you put that stuff all together, you can figure out who has applied for security clearance, what agency do they work for? Who are their family members? Where have they traveled? Where have they stayed? And if you're trying to, if you're the Chinese and you're trying to detect any, any spies who are flying in saying they're businessmen, 
um, and then meeting with your local dissidents, that's incredibly powerful because now you know, okay, somebody that we can trace back to the United States government stayed in this hotel in Beijing on this day, they can go roll back all the CCTV footage, recreate that person's movements and figure out every single Chinese person they spoke to and then go pull those people in for questioning, right? Marriott was not planning for this to be part, that they could be part of counterintelligence operations by the Ministry of State Security. And so that was not part of their threat model. And so the, the biggest thing that, you know, small company or large, and again, small companies are being hit all the time, is what is your place in the, in the world, right? When you operate, how does that affect com companies in other countries, especially countries like China? Um, and what there might their motivations be to utilize these capabilities against you? What can they get out of it? The next thing you have to do is once you've kind of thought about what your geopolitical position is, is you've got to plan for the worst case scenario. I like to think of cyber issues as, you know, as, as breaches, as like extreme weather, right? You can't predict when there's going to be a hurricane. What you can predict is that there is going to be a hurricane. You just don't know when, you don't know exactly where it's gonna land. And so you have to assume that something bad is going to happen and build your assumptions backwards from that. Um, and this, this requires you to kind of change how you think of security. Because most companies, the way they think of security is they invest some money in it, um, they invest time, they hire a couple of people, and they're like, okay, great, we're done. What you have to assume is that you will be breached, that there will be an incident where computers that you control are taken over by bad guys. And then just accept that fact and plan for how we're gonna make that as have as little impact as possible on our business and on our customers. Just like if you're operating in certain places, you have to plan for extreme weather. Now, maybe you get lucky and you never have a hurricane or you never have a tornado that you deal with, but that doesn't mean you don't plan for it. Um, and and it, it is, it's subtle, but it is a significant change in how people, um, uh, how people are able to, to build their organization and to, to, to plan out and to position security as part of their company. Technically, one of the best things you can do if you want to do this planning is you can move your stuff to the cloud. Uh, we, one of the best things that's happened in enterprise IT over the last 10 years is it's become possible to run almost your entire company and perhaps even your entire company without owning any computers other than your laptops, right? So you, you have to buy laptops and phones and stuff, but you can run a pretty good sized company without owning any computers that sit in your offices or in your own data centers. This is a great thing. It's a great thing for security because it turns out that these standardized services like email, SharePoint, file servers, things like that are the hardest things to secure against good attackers. Those are now things that you can buy off the shelf. And the two big companies that do this are Microsoft and Google. Now, I usually recommend Microsoft for most companies because most companies have started from a Windows base. And so if you're moving from on-prem Windows where you have Windows computers and Windows servers in your closet and the like, moving to Microsoft is usually easier. If you're starting from scratch, and especially if you're a smaller company, then Google might be easier. Um, it is a simpler product, uh, although most people go with the Office 365. But either case, moving your risk to those companies, each one of those companies has thousands of people that work in security. They have ex-NSA threat intel analysts. They have full-time SOCs that 24 hours a day are watching for alerts and stuff. And they get to amortize that security investment across tens of thousands of customers. Outsourcing your security risk to them is a critical, critical thing. Now that doesn't magically get rid of all your problems. And people get hacked even when they're in cloud. The one, number one problem becomes after that is how do you authenticate your users? And so people will still have the problem of, well, now that they're used to logging into Google for themselves, they'll use the same password to log into their corporate Google account. Um, and that password gets stolen from some bad website. If they've reused it for the corporate, a bad guy comes, logs in. And if the bad guy has your usernames and passwords, it doesn't really matter how good the security teams are at these companies. Um, they're, they're not going to be able to stop that. Um, and so, uh, you know, but for most of the, the kind of core technical risks, moving stuff to the cloud is really good. Azure Active Directory, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, and uh, one login and Okta are the three big kind of authentication schemes that you can deploy. Uh, and so having one place that your people log in and then magically logged in everywhere else is one of the best ways that you can prevent those kinds of security issues. And it creates a choke point where you're able to manage the identity of your users. 
This has become especially important in COVID times because now that people are working from home, either you have on-prem systems that you're providing access over a VPN and you, you have kind of the worst of both worlds where people are at home unsecured on unsecured networks, but then you also have to manage the servers themselves. Um, uh, in those, in, you know, to provide this kind of service now and to make it easier for people to work from home while also making it secure, moving in the cloud now is a great time. And then another thing that most organizations don't do is they don't practice. So you don't get good at chess by watching YouTube videos and reading books about chess. You get good at chess by playing it. Uh, and the attackers, the adversaries you're going up against are practicing constantly. This is one of the interesting differences between, again, these Chinese hackers uh, who are able to operate on behalf of private industry and American hackers is that because American hackers aren't spending all day breaking into Chinese companies, it's much harder for them to keep their skills good. And I think this is actually a big challenge uh, for our intelligence agencies is to uh, create games and simulations and practice runs internally so they can keep people uh, crisp and frosty. Uh, whereas, you know, if, if you run up against a Chinese hacking group, you might be the 50th company that that team has gone after just that year, right? You need to practice your defense. And one of the, the best thing that all companies can do of almost any size is to do a simulation of what would you do if you're breached, right? Um, breach simulations don't have to take a lot of technical fidelity. You don't have to come up with like really specific technical details. You just have to think to yourselves, okay, what is really important to us? And if we find out that that thing was broken into, what would we do next? And the way I like to do this is I like to have a team, and this can be an internal security team or it could be an outside consultant, come up with a scenario and you inject, you, you, you set aside an entire day for the, the critical people who work on this. So somebody from legal, people from communications, people from crisis uh, management, uh, a couple of members of the executive committee, you set aside a day for those folks. And at the beginning of the day, you inject the scenario. So three or four different people get an email that says, you just got, you know, the comms people, you just got a phone call from, a, uh, from the Wall Street Journal saying that they've heard you've been hacked. Uh, do you have a comment? Uh, and you get an email to your IT people saying your alerts just said that somebody has admin access to this database server. Um, and somebody into your legal team saying you just got a call from the FBI uh, saying that you've been hacked. And then you let people play out the scenario of from their different seats what would they do and how would they communicate? And one of the things you're gonna find is that the communication lines inside of the company that need to exist between all of these different functions that generally don't work together will not exist unless you've done this kind of simulation before. That's one of the ways that companies really mess up when breaches happen is they end up with three or four teams working completely independently of each other and they don't get together until the end. And so from the outside, it looks like the company doesn't know what they're doing. What it really is, is you're seeing three or four different organizations uh, operate at different paces and not be coordinated because nobody knows who's really in charge. And so doing this kind of simulation will help you discover that and it'll help you figure out, okay, well, if this kind of breach happens, Sally's in charge, right? Sally's the VP, you know, the CIO, Sally's our incident manager. Or maybe if you're a small enough company, it's the CEO, the CEO is in charge. But in any case, you're gonna figure out who's in charge, who are the line communications are, who are the, the contacts. And if you do this a couple of times, by the time a security incident happens, everybody's gonna be calm, they're gonna be collected, they're gonna know what their job is, and they're not gonna freak out. Uh, because like in almost any of these situations, panic makes it way worse. Uh, and if you look at the inside story of what happened in Maersk, and this has actually been documented from some people who've quit now, there was a huge panic inside of the IT org that was greatly increased by the fact that their IT systems were down and so people couldn't communicate. So you couldn't email your boss, you couldn't get onto the, the, the corporate chat. And so people didn't know what to do in that situation. So that should be part of your simulation is, you know, how, how will we reestablish communication? Usually that just means on people's mobile phones that you have the phone numbers of all the critical people and you're able to put together a FaceTime call or, or, or you have a, a phone bridge that you know everybody's gonna call in in an emergency. But think through those things and practice it um, so that when an incident happens, you can handle it correctly. Because one of the other things you have to know is not all breaches are made the same, right? Like there will be security incidents where if you react quickly, you react crisply, you move quickly, that in the end, you keep the bad guys from getting access to the really important data. And perhaps you don't have to do a public disclosure. Uh, perhaps it has very little long-term impact on your company. Um, and so just because a breach has happened doesn't mean it's game over. That's the start of the game, right? Um, sure, yes, they got the first touchdown, but you don't quit in the first quarter. And I think that's one of the things you've got to practice is we're down 14 points in the first quarter. What are, what are we gonna do for the next three quarters so that at the end, we feel like we're in a good place? Um, 
And the other part of that then is, uh, especially in, in industries like yours that have like very interesting international regulatory, is really think through the regulatory and legal issues that will exist from this. Um, in the United States, uh, we don't have a good, we don't have a federal data breach uh, standard. Uh, and so it's very, it is very complicated to figure out what you're going to do in different situations. My suggestion is as part of your simulation to think through this of what the kind of company you are, what kind of data do you have, and in what situations, what legal requirements do you have to notify different people, and then build a relationship with whoever your local law enforcement is going to be. For the metals industry, you're probably talking about the FBI. Uh, for something like finance, there's a breakdown between the FBI and Secret Service. Uh, but for most industries, the FBI is going to be your contact. Find out who your local cyber person is. Go just, you know, you can email a contact in your local FBI office, ask them who the cyber agent is, go get coffee, have this discussion, build that relationship. So if something happens, you are able to make that call quickly. You're able to inform them. Um, you have your lawyers on staff who know how to appropriately uh, uh, talk to law enforcement and talk to your regulators. And you've got that relationship that doesn't become, again, kind of an emergency where people are panicking. Um, thinking about the regulatory issues up front might help you avoid this kind of thing. Now, obviously, nobody on this call is going to be in the same kind of position Mark Zuckerberg is. But it is, you know, from my experience, the not thinking through the long-term kind of regulatory impact of these kinds of decisions uh, does end up hurting you. Now, as a country, we have some interesting challenges here. Again, the United States has some of the best hackers in the world. A lot of them work in this building, uh, which is the joint headquarters of US Cyber Command and the National Security Agency at, in Fort Meade, Maryland. Um, those glass windows aren't really glass. So it turns out, well, I mean, they're glass, but they're not really office windows. It turns out behind that glass, it's a facade uh, and it's all concrete um, because you know they would never have <laughs> windows from everybody's office looking out into the parking lot. Um, but you know, we have some of the best hackers in the world, but as a country, we're having trouble figuring out how we want to handle these things uh, from a defensive perspective. Uh, and, and one of the issues that we're having from a, 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 is that you know, we are engaged in hacking on behalf of the national security priorities of the United States, but we're not really playing the game for the, from the economic side. And I think that's something that the, you know, in the next four years, the next administration is really gonna have to think about is who is in charge of coming up with a strategy for the United States to play defense in these areas? If, you know, right now, you know, I live in California, uh, if, the, if the Chinese Ar uh, uh, Air Force flew a bomber overhead, that would not be the responsibility of private companies or the local sheriff's department um, or uh, even in some cases the state to protect against. That's the Air National Guard and the US Air Force, right? Like it's pretty clear in the military sense of where responsibilities fall down. But when the Chinese hack into a company, it's the responsibility of the company's tech team. It's the responsibility of the local um, cyber task force between a variety of law enforcement agencies. And then in DC, it's the responsibility of the FBI, the NSA, uh, the CIA, possibly CISA, that, uh, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security. There's this huge distributed responsibility and, and it's, it's this kind of distribution that means that we're, we're not planning as a society and I, I hope to see that change. So um, appreciate the time that we have to talk together. Uh, open to any questions, uh, if you guys want to throw them into the Q&A, otherwise we can uh, move on and, and talk about a couple of other topics, but thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you, Alex. That was uh, really interesting. I do have a couple of questions that I, I'd like to focus on. Um, the, the metals industry is unique in that there are a few very large companies who have a lot of the capabilities that you talked about, but based on what I just heard you say, there is a massive power imbalance in place here. Um, it strikes me that we're dealing almost entirely, and, and maybe I'm getting this wrong, but with um, governments and not an individual who uh, famously is sitting in his, his or her basement and who is maybe 19 years old. That, that, that sounds to me like it's pretty rare. Um, so go ahead, if you have a comment. Well, I was going to say, so there's actually, I mean, you know, I, in metals, yes. So the ge geopolitical is very important for you guys, right? Yeah. And that's what the Alcoa and U.S. Steel and, and, and other hacks have shown, um, is that you guys are in that category of company. You know, 20 years ago, it was just big banks, uh, defense contractors like the Lockheeds and stuff were in this category. And it's now any uh, 
part of the economy that the Chinese consider competitive is you're on the list, right? Um, that being said, one, not all government hackers are the same, right? Like I said, 100,000 people work for the Chinese government on this. They can't all be superstars, right? Some of them are, are, are B and C students too. So you, you're not necessarily going to, up against the same A team that they would deploy against the general dynamics uh, against the metals industry, right? And so you don't have to, you know, you don't have to meet, uh, assume that their skills are so good that they can't get in. There are things you can do to protect yourself. The second is the other thing that any company that's not specific to metals, that any company of any size has to worry about now is ransomware. Um, and that's actually what's hitting lots of people right now. Um, ransomware is where you get malware on your computer, it encrypts all your files, and it says you have 24 hours to send us $10,000, $20,000, $50,000. $50, otherwise, we're deleting your old hard drive. And um, in most cases, unless you have good backups, there's no good way to get that data back without paying it, right? Um, and so all the, all the people on the phone, I think one should first worry about the ransomware threat because that's just kind of the baseline you have to live with. You have to patch your computers, you have to have antivirus, you have to back everything up. The, another great thing about 2020 is backing stuff up used to mean you had to have a robot that had like tapes in it, you know? Like you had to have physical I things. I remember those. Yeah, you remember that. Not anymore. Like the backing stuff up into the cloud is really easy. If you're a really small company, I really like Backblaze is the name of a company that provides yep. an all you can eat backup. And so you just pay per computer and it's whatever, 50 bucks a year or something is the cheapest 50 bucks you'll ever spend if you end up with ransomware, right? Um, and then for larger companies, the, their IT teams can look at a variety of different managed cloud backup, but there's a ton of managed cloud backup solutions. So I, I think I, I wouldn't, but yes, I'm talking about governments here, but I don't want that to, to make people feel kind of nihilistic, like they, they've definitely lost. Well, you, you answered the question in a really good way. That's kind of what I was getting at is you're, you're not, you're not, you shouldn't roll over and play dead yet, right? It, right. There are things right. you can do. Can you talk a little bit, because I want to leave a little bit of time to talk about the election, but, but can you talk a little bit about the most common vector that's used to get somebody into a ransomware problem. I mean, my understanding is that phishing is the thing that we all have to worry about the most. Phishing and spear phishing. Yeah, so uh, uh, an email that has a document that's malicious is probably the number one right now. Um, and there, you know, you, you can, a lot of companies just try to train people not to open up documents. I think that's a, a losing battle because just to conduct business, you, there are a lot of people who have to open up documents from strangers, right? Accounts payable team, if you get a P, you know, somebody says they have a PO, you're going to open it, right? Um, uh, the legal department, if somebody says you're being sued, you're, you're being served, um, uh, you're going to open it, right? And so, and, and the bad guys know this, and so they, are, they specifically target people in companies. So what they'll do is they'll go on LinkedIn, uh, they'll figure out who's the accounts payable person, they'll get their email, and then they'll send something that looks like an invoice, and a box pops up and says, do you want to run macros? And somebody says, yes. And then that is how malware gets installed. Um, second most common is they send you to a link. And then through that link, you go to a site and then they break into your web rev. So um, in either of those cases, having good anti-malware software on your computer is smart. Having the latest patches installed is really critical. Uh, for the vast majority of ransomware, uh, the bugs that are being exploited have already been patched. In fact, the not patch a worm that hit, got hit by Maersk, the patch for that had been out for three months, right? So it's the fact that Maersk had not patched ended up almost costing them their entire business. So having just a good patch cycle that, you know, patch Tuesday, in the first Tuesday of every month, Microsoft dumps out 15, 20 new patches. Um, and then there's different cycles for different pieces of software, but Microsoft for most companies is the most important. Making sure that that stuff gets deployed within 24 hours is super critical um, because that's, it's the first 24 to 48 hours that gets really dangerous because the patch will come out, the bad guys will reverse engineer it, they'll figure out what the bug is, they'll, they'll put it in malware, and then they try to get it in for those first couple of days. That's the so-called um, zero day problem, right? I'm sorry, Chris? That's, that's the so-called zero day problem. Right, well, that's, that's what we call one day or two days. So zero okay. day would be before the patch is available, right. which probably almost none of the companies on this call have to care about. Like we had to care about that at Facebook, but even Facebook was on the edge. Like if you have a true zero day in Windows, that is such a powerful thing. You're going to use it to steal millions and millions of dollars. Um, right. It is the end day patch of the first three or four days that, yeah. that, that is really dangerous for most companies. Okay, could you um, mention again the backup company that you talked about just a minute ago? We got a question here that. Yeah, I'll type it in, um, but it's called Backblaze. Uh, okay. But I also put the name uh, into there. Backblaze, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I use that personally. 
So I'd be happy to send the link <laughs> to anybody who wants to send me an email. Right, you can send the coupon code, I think, right? Yeah, that's right, that's right. Next question real quick. Um, what are your thoughts on Windows 7 computers these days and putting them on your networks? Yeah, so you should, you should strive to only be on the latest version of Windows at any time. Um, Windows 7 is close to being end of life. And yeah. even, even while it's still being patched as it is right now, um, uh, it, is, uh, it is lacking some basic security protections that are in later versions. So I, really everybody should be on Windows 10. I know it can be a cost, um, but in the long run, it's way cheaper. In, in terms of, of company capabilities and software, real quick, um, there are a lot of companies on this call and in this industry who have CNC machines, um, sawing ma machines of various sorts. Um, is that something to worry about, kind of IoT in general? Yeah, it is something to worry about. Now, I think, you know, I, I would generally, for the companies here, I would generally not worry so much about um, these machines being directly attacked for, on purpose. But what we have seen is a variety of different worms and pieces of ransomware that will spread automatically between embedded IOC systems, either because they're running things like Windows XP embedded or be, because they're running some old version of Linux. And the real problem with IOT systems is they're impossible to patch, right? Yeah. Like the vast majority of these things I, I bet have never been updated since people bought them um, or they get updated once a year perhaps. Uh, so uh, yes, you absolutely have to worry about IOT security. The, the most practical thing you can do is you can put it on its own isolated network. Um, so first off, a lot, of, you know, a lot of these guys are not going to need real internet access. So you can restrict them from getting out to the internet. They'll, they'll maybe only have to talk to internal systems. Um, and if you're, if you're bridging between your Windows network, your corporate network and the IoT systems, what you want to do is to put something in the middle there. So uh, for example, a lot of people will have an AutoCAD design and that AutoCAD design is being done on a laptop where now somebody's working from home, right? Um, and they're doing their web browsing, they're opening email, they're doing lots of stuff. So you can't protect that machine that well. Um, but what you can do is you can build a file server in the middle that they can drop the file onto and that the IoT machine can pull it from. And so that system bridges the two networks, but the IoT machine can't talk directly to your desktop and it can't talk out to the internet. Um, and so those kinds of basic network protections are smart. The other thing is, if you're large enough to have a security team that can deploy network sensors, then deploying it on the, on the IoT network is a smart place. Because the nice thing about IoT things is they don't browse the web all day, right? And so if you have any connection from an IoT machine to some Russian IP, that is definitely not good, right? Like it's not because somebody clicked on a, 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 a video they shouldn't be watching at work. Um, it's definitely something bad. And so uh, network segmentation and kind of traditional network uh, intrusion detection works really well in the IoT situation. How involved should uh, a company's board of directors and the people in corner offices be in cybersecurity? Ah, so for boards of directors, security is this really interesting challenge in that um, they are now being held responsible for, uh, and in some cases personally, there have now been lawsuits uh, and uh, SEC actions against individual directors uh, for security breaches. When um, most boards, almost all, very few boards have anybody with any security experience on it. So it's not like finance or uh, marketing or the other areas where you always have somebody with expertise. There's a couple of corporations that post breach have put kind of CISOs on their board, but it's very, very rare. Um, and so they don't have a lot of expertise and they don't have a lot of levers they can pull. Maybe they meet with the CISO once a year and the CISO is like, here's a big piece of pile of paper. Um, and uh, everything is, you know, I need more money, but everything's great, right? That's the message you'll hear from every CISO to every board ever. Um, so my suggestion for boards is if you're worried about these kinds of things, uh, one, ask your CISO to provide a briefing on the kinds of threats that you're facing and what they're planning for, right? Because one of the things, it, it's impractical. Boards are not going to look at here's our firewall plan and then have a, a useful right. opinion. Right. But what a board can do is have their CISO brief them of what are the risks we are facing as an organization. Um, and I want you to explain what you're doing and can judge whether they're being realistic and they're being paranoid enough. Because it's quite, you know, there's a lot of CISOs who maybe are not thinking globally. They're not thinking about the big picture of, of where they plug in as a company. Uh, the second thing they can do is they can go get an outside opinion. And I do recommend boards that are really worried for this kind of stuff to go hire a consulting company 
to go do kind of a top to bottom risk assessment. Uh, and there's a couple of companies I recommend for that. Um, one's called Bishop Fox. Uh, I'll type that in the chat. Um, uh, they're like a, a, a well-regarded consultancy. Uh, if you're international, another one is called NC Group. So they're in London. So they have more kind of overseas capabilities. Um, but hiring one of these companies to work on behalf of the board and to do kind of an overall risk assessment, I, I think is not a, it's not a bad idea. Okay. We're, we're almost out of time, but I do don't want to let you get away uh, without talking about election security. So where, yeah. where is the U.S. in regard to that right now? Oof. Um, it's not great, Chris. Uh, <laughs> I was afraid um, you were going to say that. Yeah. Well, I, the United States, we have a couple of really specific issues uh, that we are facing um, that other countries don't face. So the first is our elections in the United States are run by about 10,000 different election authorities, yeah. right? Yeah. Counties, cities are running elections. And um, you know, back to my kind of metaphor of if the Chinese Air Force flies overhead, it's definitely the Air Force's problem. The way we do election security is the Chinese Air Force flies overhead. And for me, it's the Redwood City Police Department is supposed to respond, yeah. right? right. And, and so that's like what we're dealing with here is that like local officials who often don't have dedicated IT security folks, um, or they have one person who doesn't usually play at this level are going up against Russian and Chinese military hackers. Um, now, some of that has changed since 2016. Uh, DHS CISA, CISA was created uh, as a defensive agency and they have some responsibility, but they have no ability to tell the locals what to do. Um, so we're in this kind of weird place where they can provide advice, they can provide support, but it's completely voluntary. And so we have a really different patchwork of some states are taking it seriously, some aren't. And unfortunately, there's a couple of states that are not taking it seriously, who also are swing states. And so that's really risky. And so that's on the direct cyber side. We also have like a real disinformation problem. Um, yeah. You know, the United States has very uh, traditionally has not restricted people's political speech that happens online. Um, I think that's a good thing, but our freedoms there are being used against us, right? And uh, that's what I'm focused on because it's where I can provide some more value here. Uh, we have this thing called the Election Integrity Partnership, which is four different organizations that are working on finding and stopping election disinformation. This year, it's really, the disinformation is really crazy because of COVID, because everything's changed. We're moving to a lot of vote by mail. And for people who are not voting by mail are standing in long lines. They have lots of restrictions around how they can vote. Uh, and so because already, people are liable to think that, that the voting process has been changed in a lot of ways. They are really open to claims that it's been rigged. Um, and th that's my biggest concern is less on the direct technical attacks, although that's a problem, and more about disinformation attacks that convince a large percentage of the population that the election was stolen. Okay, so um, by the time you're done with uh, at, least, at least the pressure on you, because I know you're directly involved, yeah. Uh, is up. We do have another session scheduled after the election, where maybe we can talk about that a little more. But um, yeah. we need to let you go now. Okay, great. We're, we've run out of time. I want to thank you, Alex, for, for um, helping us out. I know you're really busy, and that's why. Um, I want to tell everybody who uh, listened in today that we're trying something new. You're going to get prompted to complete a post-webinar survey the minute you log off of this webinar. And it, we'd appreciate you filling that out because we, we need your intelligence and suggestions on what topics you'd like to hear about next. And you can directly address this session in particular, but anything else that you'd like to talk about, we'd like to, to hear your thoughts. We have another, another webinar next week on, it, it's a, a technology oriented session on the future of industrial metal sales. That'll be on Wednesday the 2nd at one o'clock in the afternoon, central time. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Alex, once again. Uh, I'd like everybody to have a safe day and be well and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.